In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God, Amen. Welcome, my beloved, to our monthly questions and answers session, which we do live on a monthly basis. It's always wonderful to be able to spend this time with all of you and to hear so many of the wonderful questions that you have regarding the faith, regarding how to approach your spiritual life, and so on and so forth. We're always excited because this gives us a chance to be able to hear from you and to answer some of the questions that you might have. And at the same time, it allows us to be able to connect with you and maybe allow us to learn a little bit more about the things that interest you so we can make more and more content on so many of the subjects that you like to question us about. So this week, as we always do, we'll go ahead and give a chance for everyone to slowly log in and to join us. And as people join us, you can go ahead and post your questions um, directly on the chat. And as we move forward, we'll go ahead and ask them, we'll go ahead and answer them as best as we can as all of you uh, begin to pose your questions. So to break the ice, we'll go ahead and answer one of the questions that uh, we have that has been submitted to us already online through the website www.copticorthodoxanswers.org or through our Facebook posts or Instagram or Twitter. Some of you submit to us via a variety of different ways, and so we appreciate all that you send to us. We'll go ahead and break the ice with one of the questions that was asked to us here. Okay, so the question says the following. In regards to the spiritual life, am I as a Christian expected to resign my will entirely or are there boundaries that should be set between me and others to make sure I am not taken advantage of? Okay, so very good question. And I want to reassure all of you that when we speak of the Christian faith, there is obviously a very clear teaching that our Lord Jesus Christ gives to us, especially when you read Matthew chapter 5, 6, and 7. The talks to us specifically about the importance of adopting that Christian mindset, that mindset where we resign ourselves in order for us to be as humble as our Savior is. St. Paul talks about this in the book of Philippians where he says, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. And he describes this mind as one that is kenotic, one that is self-emptying. Now, obviously, the Lord wants us to be able to love one another to the extent where we are willing to place the other above ourselves, where we are willing to give priority to our brother or sister or our loved one for the sake of being able to elevate that person and place myself last. Christ teaches his disciples and who says, whoever wants to be the first among you, let him be a slave to all. Now, obviously, these are teachings that sometimes scare people because to them, they want to set proper boundaries so that nobody takes advantage of them so that they are not walked all over and so on and so forth. Just make sure that when you say those things, you actually intend to speak to them, uh, to speak of them as healthy boundaries. Because if what we're really saying is my ego won't allow me to be able to humble myself, or what we're saying is that my honor won't allow me to have a person place me beneath them, then there's absolutely no kashadi in that. The intention of the heart has to be that I am more than willing to place myself last, that I am willing to, if someone slaps me on the right cheek, to offer the left. If one person obliges me to walk one mile, I will walk a second. If one asks me for my cloak, I will give him my tunic also, and so on and so forth. That spirit, that mindset, which was in Christ Jesus, we also have to have within us. And we don't have to worry about boundaries if everything is done in love. Now, where we do find ourselves in abusive relationships, where a person's intention is to hurt us. If we have to set a boundary, then we go ahead and do that, but we do it in a Christian manner. We don't do it with the intention of being vengeful, but rather to be able to say, this is where I have to draw a line for the sake of the protection of those that I am responsible to. And so this sometimes can happen between a husband and wife, between a brother or a sister, between friends, where that person's expectation is, if you love me, you will do as I wish at all times, even if that means crossing into sinful acts or doing things that otherwise would have us go against the gospel. So, the only reasons we should be drawing boundaries is if we are provoked into entering into a reality where we go against the teachings of the church, where we go against the teachings that Christ himself has spoken to us. But other than that, we really do have to pray for humility. We have to pray for that mindset of meekness so that God can allow us to be more and more like his son who emptied himself for the sake of the salvation of the world. All right, we have a few people who are already asking questions. This is exciting. Let's go ahead and jump right in. Jeffen asks, why do you think that the COVID happened if God so loves the world? Well, my beloved, it's important to understand COVID happened because of a variety of different things. First and foremost, there's a tremendous amount of evidence that the actual COVID virus 
was one that was manufactured. Now, what was the reasons behind its manufacturing and why was a lab trying to create this kind of virus? Your guess is as good as mine, and obviously there's there's no valid Christian reason for it. Some people believe it was um, it was for some sort of warfare, um, regardless of what that may be true or not. It's not the discussion that we're going to have today. But one thing is for sure, we have to recognize that God allows humanity to be fully free. And a big part of the problem in humanity being free is that we have the option of doing great things in Christ Jesus, or we have the option of being absolutely disastrous as far as the generation. We can be the cause of so much havoc and so much pain and so much suffering. And we can also do incredible things through the gift that God has given us when he created us in his image and likeness. A big part of why COVID happened, to be quite honest, is very is very probably, um, if not assuredly, the free will of humanity that was improperly expressed through some sort of selfish ambition. And that's the honest to God truth. A big part of why it wasn't managed properly is yet again because politics get involved, because power gets involved, because people capitalize on the possibility of making money off of other people's sufferings or their pursuit of healing. There is so much there to be unpacked. But when God allows us to be free, this is his expression of love to us. The same way that he created Adam and Eve, he placed them in the garden, but he gave them a way out. He didn't lock every door in the garden and say, Because I know what's best for you, I won't give you an option of leaving me. No, he gave them the option of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And he told them, this is your way out. If you want to not be under my authority, if you don't want to be governed by me, a God who loves you, then you can choose to be your own gods. You can worship yourself and you don't have to worship me. You can be your own source of information and pursue knowledge of evil and pursue knowledge of good through your own means rather than having me be the author of all that you know. And that's exactly what humanity continues to do. Humanity continues to choose itself rather than to choose God, to place ourselves as those who are worthy of worship and attention and energy rather than focusing on the fact that we ought to be directing ourselves towards God Almighty. Again, the COVID conversation is a very lengthy one. and We can probably attack it from a variety of different ways, but I really don't want us to be so quick to think that God is the one who authored it. God allowed it. The same way that he allowed Adam and Eve to eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, the same way that he allowed every single one of us to choose some sinful act that we've committed in our life. He gives us that freedom, but it does not mean that that is his will. We have to make a distinction between when God allows and what God actually wills. We can get into that a little bit further, but if you want more information on that subject, by all means, please take a look at some of the videos that we've already posted, and you'll see that we address God's will and what God allows and why he planted the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. All of those things are mentioned in so many of our videos. God bless you, and thank you for asking. John says, hello, Abuna. Why did John the Baptist doubt that Jesus was the one when he sent his disciples to ask him who he is, although he recognized him when he baptized him? So that's a very good question, John. I just want you to be careful because the interpretation of that passage is not that John doubted that he was the Messiah. Is that he wanted them to be able to hear the confirmation directly from him. You have to remember that John was capable of recognizing him even in the womb of his mother, Elizabeth. When Mary came to visit Elizabeth, the womb that was in the, the, the baby that was in the womb of, of Elizabeth leaped with joy over the fact that he recognized that his savior or that the mother of his savior was in his presence. So the same spirit that leads John to know this even in the womb, surely it does not allow for John, uh, surely the spirit does not allow for John to doubt whether or not that is truly Christ Jesus. And this is why he's capable of recognizing him through the spirit and says, this is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. What John was hoping to do is to be able to give confirmation to his very disciples because he would then later on tell them what? You go pursue him. You go follow him. I discipled you for a short period, but you are to be his disciples. I hope that makes sense, John. Tawlid says, hi, Abuna. Good to see you. Very nice to have all of you with us. Thank you so much, Tawlid, for the greeting. Blasson says, do angels have free will like human beings? If so, why can't God restore them? to like he did in the case of human beings. So listen, no, we don't actually believe that they have free will in the same way that we do. The story of the angels and the angelic beings and the celestial realities is one that is very complicated and many of us don't know 
too much on the subject because revelation has not granted us to know everything. Scripture and tradition teaches us just a little bit about the celestial beings. It talks to us about how there was a period where they had free will, but the free will that was given to them is not at all the same free will that was given to us who are children of God. Now, when I say children of God, I want you to recognize that humanity is very unique. Humanity is very unique in the sense that we are very much created in God's image and likeness. We have a grace and a gift that was given to us that has not been granted to the rest of creation, even the angelic beings. As a matter of fact, in the liturgical prayers of the church, in the Coptic rite, there is a sentence that we say where we talk about how the even the angels desire to behold what we see freely in the liturgy, and they cannot. There is a freedom and a grace and a mystery that has been granted to us and how God expressed his love uniquely to humanity. And a part of that uniqueness is the fact that we have been granted a free will that is unlike what is given to the rest of the celestial bodies, to those servants of God, those angels, those children of God who are the angelic beings. The freedom that has been given to them is to choose. And once they have chosen... The decision, the decision is pretty much irreversible. At least this is what has been taught to us in tradition. And so when the angels were given the choice, follow Lucifer or stay with me, those who followed Lucifer are eternally going to be in that state, the same way that the angels who remained with the Lord, led by Archangel Michael, as mentioned in the epistle of St. Jude, um, and also I believe it's also mentioned in the epistle of St. Peter, if I'm not mistaken. But those epistles confirm to us that there are those who stayed and a third of the heavens also decided to follow Lucifer. And that became the demonic armies that still war against humanity until today. And so their free will was to choose once. And then finally, that is in an eternal state. Now, whether or not that is the fullness of the story, whether or not there is more to it than we understand, most probably, that is the only things that we know because of revelation. But we don't know the full story. Um, and the full story only God will reveal to us in the fullness of time. Another question is, what is the difference between Coptic Orthodox and, for example, Russian Orthodox? They're very, very similar. Very, very similar. For the most part, some of the differences, if we want to talk about a theological stance, there's some who might argue that, <clears throat> that we have different Christological stances, but that's, that's simply no longer true. Once upon a time, uh, we definitely did not agree on both the outcome and the way that the Council of Chalcedon is confessed. That is definitely the breaking point between the Oriental Orthodox and the Eastern Orthodox. But ever since they also had Council number five, number six, number seven, which we did not participate in, but specifically Council number five, where they reiterated and clarified and even corrected certain things about Chalcedon that we had a diff that we had differences with. Um, today we have no problem in recognizing that between us and the Russians and the Ukrainians. Um, and the Greeks and the Romanians and so on and so forth, so many of our brothers and sisters from the Eastern Orthodox Church. Today we can say that even though we confess things differently, we don't use the same terminology, we really are saying the same thing. And so, so much of our faith is identical. Um, however, historically, are certain events and certain periods interpreted in the same way? No, we don't have the same saints. There are some people that in, histor his in, in history, the Eastern Orthodox Church might call some of our saints um, heretics, and we might confess that some of their own people are heretics, uh, and that we call our own people the defenders of the faith. And I think that's simply interpretation of history. But for the most part, as far as our theology goes, I would like to say that it's 99% the same, if not even 100 Um and this is why I think there is a beautiful communion of love that exists between all of the Orthodox churches. Now, there are people... On, in every family that are on both extremes, um, people on one extreme who would say there has never been any differences and it's all politics, which is not entirely true. And then there is another group of people who would say, no, it's all theology and the other side is heretical, which is not entirely true. The balance is often found somewhere in the middle where we recognize that history did not um, did not do us any favors. And unfortunately, there was political play and there was power struggle and there was miscommunication and misinterpretation that people might have had the right intentions, but unfortunately, things did not work out the way we would have wanted it to, which led to schism, which pleases no one. No one is pleased with schism. No one is pleased with a breaking in the body of Christ. But today, by God's grace, I can say that there is so much similarity, that there is a beautiful bond of love between us and our brothers and sisters in the Eastern Orthodox Church. We pray that one day our, uh, our elders, the synods, might come together and finally decide uh, to remove the anathemas and hopefully 
uh, be in full communion. But until then, we continue to pray for the unity of the one holy Catholic and Orthodox Church. Okay, let's see if there's another question. Please let me know your opinion on apocatastasis. So apocatastasis is a teaching that universally all of creation will be restored by God's mercy. That somehow um, all those who have fallen away will eventually come back to the knowledge of the truth and worship before our holy God, the Trinity, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. And some would even include in this apocatastasis the idea that even the demons will repent. So I, what I want you to know is that at the level of doctrine or specific theology that is taught in the church, apocatastasis is not recognized. It's not taught as an official doctrine in the Orthodox Church. There are some of our saints uh, who have spoken of it and who have hoped for it and who have taught that this is what the hope of every Christian should be. And to be honest with you, I think that I agree with them that this should be our hope. But I want us to make a distinction between what we hope for and when we could, what we can teach as 100% true. We can definitely hope that all of creation comes to the knowledge of the truth. And this, I believe, is God's desire. God's desire is that all of his creation be reconciled to him. This is why on the cross he was capable of saying, forgive them, Father, for they know not what they do. We desire that every knee would bow down and worship before Christ Jesus our Lord and to give glory to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit. This should be our deepest desire, that eventually God's mercy and his love and his infinite justice and compassion eventually lead every soul back to him, all of creation, regardless of how God sees that fit to do. That should be our desire. None of us should be upset to find out that God was capable of winning over a soul that once considered God their enemy, and now they worship God in absolute love and absolute freedom. All of us should look forward to that. But can we teach that this is what's going to happen? Can we say that this is precisely what we know will happen? No, of course not. There's so many passages in Scripture, even spoken by Christ Jesus our Lord, that make it clear that there will be a period of condemnation for those who do not come to the knowledge of the truth, that there will be a damnation, that there is such a thing as hell, and that, yes, absolutely, there will be a judgment, and that judgment will happen in eternal life. Now, how we can reconcile both of these things, I don't know. But one thing is for sure, because I know the heart of God and His love that He has for even a sinner like me, I should pray that every sinner get to taste the sweetness of His love. I should pray that somehow, in His infinite mercy and care and love and compassion and mercy and justice, that God finds a way to be able to win every soul back to him because I want my God to be worshipped by all. I want my God to be recognized as the one true Lord by every soul that has ever been created by him. This should be our hope. And while we hope for it, and we might even pray for it, we cannot possibly teach it as if, don't worry, this is what's going to happen and God's going to win over every soul. We can't speak in that way definitively. We can only pray for it. I hope that answers your question. Abuna, why doesn't God reveal himself in an obvious way like he did in biblical times? How do you strengthen your faith when you feel like there is no response? Well, that, that, that's really, it's a really interesting statement because I'm not really sure um, how much more obvious he can be when he takes on the form of a man and comes and lives among us. <laughs> he walks on the earth for 33 years and he declares himself to be 100% divine, coessential with his father. He says, whoever has seen me has seen my father. Have I been with you so long, and uh, Philip, and you still do not know me? That he comes and he heals the man who was blind. He gives sight to those who uh, did not have that sight before. He raises the dead like Lazarus. He's capable of casting out those demons. And he does all of these incredible things to demonstrate that he really is the God of all creation. There's not much more obvious than that. If what we're suggesting is, well, no, what I mean by obvious is that he has to do it in front of me. I'm not really sure that's how it works. Because if humanity was capable of rejecting him and his own people, the Jews, who recognized that he was fulfilling the prophecies, even they were willing to turn a blind eye to him. That I'm not really sure that if he appeared to me in my bedroom tonight, if Christ appeared again in the sky tomorrow morning, seen by all, some people would convert. So many would rebel. So many would grow in their hatred towards God. Very upset. 
because to them he stands against the possibility of them recognizing themselves as God. I don't think it's as obvious as we might think. We might say to ourselves, if he were to appear tomorrow, for sure everyone would believe. I would love, I would love to believe that to be true. But his very incarnation demonstrates that that's not the case. Our responsibility is to represent him, to be yet again ambassadors of Christ, to be icons of the living God, that every single one of us might be truly Christian. Many Christs who walk around and preach his name through our actions first and then afterwards with our words, that people might get to know him through us. I pray this becomes the way that God makes himself that much more obvious in the world through every single one of us who choose to be his disciples. We have another question that says, uh, God bless and prayers for you, Father Murad. Please pray for me, a miserable sinner. Uh, my dear brother Bryce, may the Lord give you strength and grace. You are not miserable in him. In him you are more than conquerors, and in him you are victorious. May the Lord grant you all of the victory and all of the grace in knowing that you are precious in his sight. How do we go about approaching the biblical canon? I love the, the Oriental Orthodox communion, but I feel convicted to pursue the Ethiopian rite since it has the most books. By all means, I think that the, 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 the scriptural canon might have variety between, like you said here, the Ethiopian, the Oriental Orthodox, the, the apostolic churches for the most part, um, the Catholic Church, the Eastern Orthodox, the Oriental Orthodox, we all believe in the Dutch canonical books. Um, and we all confess them. The Ethiopian have a little bit more, but by all means, read them. Read them and get to know them. Um, we don't have much commentary from the early church on many of the books that are found in the Ethiopian canon. We do have a lot of commentary on every single one of the books um, that we have access to when it comes to many of the apostolic canons. Uh, but by all means, it's not because it's not part of your current right that you shouldn't read it. Read it and take what is good from it. The Book of Enoch is a very interesting book that I recommend all of us get to know a little bit further. And so, yes, by all means, please allow yourself to have access to uh, the, these different books that we read in the different canons. Um, but there, I don't believe that we should be sitting here arguing whether one is right and the other is wrong. We can have discussions as which one is more complete. We should have discussions about historically which ones are did the church confess and why did they come into the different traditions. But ultimately, I don't think there's any need for us to shy away from saying that I want to read and know what is in there. I hope that answers your question, Bryce. <clears throat> The son asks, does Orthodox faith believe that if there is God, there is also evil? Or does it believe that everything is from God himself, meaning even Satan's existence is in God? All that exists finds its existence in God. So according to the Orthodox Church and the Orthodox belief, there is only one creator. There is only one origin, and that is God. He is the one who is uncreated. Everything else is created. So we definitely don't believe in dualism. The dualism, this idea of that there is two gods, there is the trinity and there is the devil. The devil is not a god, the devil is a creature. And the devil has absolutely no chance of ever being victorious over our god. Let me be very clear. There are some people, my beloved, who believe that somehow in this idea that God and the devil are sitting down and they're arm wrestling. No, there's no arm wrestling match. It's not even a competition. No one gets in the ring with our god. Our god is that much greater. It, it's not even fathomable to think that anyone can consider themselves equal to God. And this is why it's so important for us to understand. Satan is in no way measuring up to the standard that we have as how we view our creator, the author of life, him who brings all things into existence. So yes, if anything exists, anything at all, this table, this chair, myself, my children, those who lived thousands of years ago, they only to continue to find their existence in him who is the great I am, him who is the being. Only he is the one who exists truly in and of himself. The rest of us only exist in and through him. I hope that makes sense. Another question says, Hi Abuna, happy night, Ruz. Blessed feast to you too. Would you please explain the context of the Holy Scriptures that says, do not call someone idiot. Christ called some brood of vipers. Why not idiots? Thank you. Okay, so I think there is a very interesting parallel that can be made. And I remember reading commentary on this specifically. There is a very big difference between characterizing people for the sake of the repentance and speaking in anger and in hate towards a person. So, for instance, Scripture talks about if you call your brother Raka, 
or if you call him stupid or idiot, you are deserving of hellfire. When Christ is speaking to his children, and don't ever forget that, the Pharisees are indeed his children. Those who are hypocrites, which he calls brood of vipers, his intention is to be able to have them wake up and recognize you share in the very characteristics of those who are hypocrites, those who intend to hurt others, those who carry venom and inject it into others without even realizing it. What he is doing is calling them to repentance. This is very different from when I get upset and somebody cuts me off in traffic and I get road rage and a whole bunch of very colorful words might come out of my mouth. That is not the same spirit at all that is found within me that was found in Christ when he was calling his children to repentance, telling them do not be like whitewashed tombs where on the outside they look like they're beautiful and washed and sparkling, but on the inside all they carry is what? Dead man's bones, he says. All of this was intentional to be able to awaken their conscience and to have them come back to repent. I pray that you recognize that difference. It's extremely important. When Christ speaks with that tone where he expresses holy anger towards evil, it's very different from when, unfortunately, my anger is much more a tool of evil than it is an anger towards evil. Another question says, do we need to take the story of Eden Garden and the trees and the serpent in the real meaning? Or is it a poetic way of explaining the relation between God, man, and in the beginning? I think we have to consider both of them. I don't think you can afford to choose one or the other. We have to know that Eden really existed. We have to know that Adam and Eve are really indeed people. And we also have to know that there was a serpent of some form. When I say serpent here... You don't necessarily have to believe that it looked like a snake that we have today. The same way that people love to speak of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil as if it was an apple tree. It wasn't an apple. We have no idea of what it was. Some people will argue and say it was a pomegranate. We don't know what it was. <laughs> we have no idea what it was and we don't care to literally know. What we do know for sure is that Adam and Eve are real. And they really did live in the presence of God. And there really was a source of evil that convinced them to follow their own path rather than God. And so you have to be able to see the fact that it is very real, while not necessarily limiting yourself to it being literal. And this is where people get confused. Some people say, well, oh, no, if I don't interpret it literally, then that means it's not real. Well, that, that's not necessarily true. Even in common day language, we use sentences and the way that we speak, oftentimes we tell people, don't take me literally, but we expect them to take us seriously. So when I say, for instance, uh, my brother broke my heart. Oh, the other day he broke my heart with what he did. What am I saying? Am I suggesting that he literally broke my heart? That he stuck his fist into my chest and he pulled out my heart and he broke my heart into pieces? Of course not. None of you would understand it in that way. I don't expect you to take it literally. But I am describing something to you that is very real. I am using that metaphoric language with the intention of pointing to something that is very real, that has to be taken seriously, and that is something that is very true. And it doesn't have to be literal in order for you to understand it. So again, with the Garden of Eden, we have to know that things that, 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 what, that story is one that carries to us so many things that are 100% real. And they cannot be spoken of simply as myth, as if they were fake, as if they were just stories that we tell children. No, they are very much real. But do we have to understand them literally? Not necessarily. I personally believe that there's a lot in that story that can be understood literally. And there's other things that we don't have to apply the literal extraction of the words because, again, we're going to get into an even bigger argument if we start talking about the translation. If the translation is 100% accurate, what, 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 what do these words actually mean in Hebrew uh, or in the original language that we were written in and how were they understood by the people who read them? There's a lot there to unpack. But I hope my example of literal versus real gives you some insight as, as to how we can approach the question. Thank you for that question. It's very, very good. Another question says, on Christian anthropology, what are the roles of the heart, the mind, the soul, and the body? Why does one often have conflicting views on negotiate, uh, 